Welcome to my series on Terry Eagleton's book, Literary Theory and Introduction. I'm Masood Raja, and today I'll be talking about chapter three of Eagleton's book, which is entitled Structuralism and Semiotics. Now, if you have watched my previous lectures, you probably already know that uh, we have covered new criticism. We've covered partially how English rises as a discipline of study. Now, in this chapter, Eagleton is moving us from new criticism to structuralist criticism. And as always, you know, he tells us a story. He gives us certain reasons and then gives us a discussion of various major figures related to this field of study. And in that, he's offering us not of Fry, the Canadian scholar, as a bridge figure, who in 1957 publishes a book called um, Anatomy of Criticism. Now, Fry was, of course, a trained theologian, and he was a Christian uh, liberal humanist. But what Eagleton is trying to explain to us is that his argument against new criticism, other than its practices of trying to objectively read the text, was that, that even though the critics were reading the text carefully, words on a page, but he thought that there was no system, scientific larger system, under which all literature and modes of reading could be organized and governed. And that's what he sets out to do in his book, uh, The Anatomy of Criticism. And in order to do that, what he first theorizes is that, and this is on page 80, what he basically suggests is that if you look at all narrative structures, all narrative structures can be reduced to four narrative categories. And he calls them comic romantic, tragic, and ironic, okay? And so if we can assume, which he does, that there are only four narrative categories in which all narratives can be organized, then he goes on to further explain various characteristics of each, well, what is included in a comic, what is included in a romantic category, and he, creates corresponding larger systems to them. So let's say comic is related to the mythos of spring, you know, romantic with mythos of summer, uh, tragic with autumn, and, you know, ironic with winter. And if you read Anatomy of Criticism, you can see that after he has defined these larger mythos, within which each narrative structure falls, then he correspondingly picks Shakespearean plays that he categorizes accordingly and then reads them. Now, uh, Fry also creates space in literary criticism of acknowledging that literary texts are informed by other texts and that information, that connection is cyclical. We can sometimes be in an ironic age. We can sometimes be in romantic age. These mythos, like the seasons, they repeat themselves and we have to figure out where we are at a certain point in history. And then within each uh, mythos, you can read it according to the logic of its expectations. What kind of a hero would it be? If it's a romance, the hero would be probably above our general understandings of a common person. If it is ironic, maybe below us. Same in comedy. But there is a system that he creates, and there is a hint at historicity. But by history, what he means isn't the history of the world within which the literature is produced. No, for him, the literary world is closed and the aesthetic object exists for itself, is informed by other aesthetic objects. So the, his idea of history or of literary history is history of literature only and no material history as it unfolds in the world forms part of his system. But Fry is a huge figure 
in trying to create a scientific system of study. And he still relies on the close reading of text and the techniques developed by new critics. But Eagleton is adding him into the structuralist because there is loosely, we could call him a structuralist because he is invoking these larger uh, taxonomic, uh, tax, taxonomical structures within which different modes of ways of reading the text or different genres of text can be classified. Then on page 82, uh, Eagleton gives us a definition of structuralism, right? And I can go to page 82 here and see uh, what does he mean by it. So structuralism as the, and I can show it to you, I'm trying to show it to you on the screen here. Uh, so what he's saying is structuralism, as the term suggests, is a concern, concern with structures and more particularly with examining the general laws by which they work. Okay, roughly speaking, structuralism is concerned with structures and more particularly with examining the general. So this is like roughly the general definition of structuralism that he's giving us. And if we apply that to Norta Fry, we can see that he can qualify as a kind of structuralist, right? Because the concern is with the larger structures of the text within which each text is produced. But, you know, on page 83, again, he gives us, you know, his three major points about structuralism, and that's at the bottom of the page 83. And I can show it to you here, um, you know, on screen, if we go to page 83, uh, towards the bottom of the page, he gives us these three things. Uh, first of all, the relation between the various items of the story may be ones of parallelism and all, but the three points that must be noted about the method in structuralism, he says, is first, it does not matter to structuralism that this story is hardly an example of great literature. So uh, first of all, no value is placed on whether it's a good story or not. You're just studying its structure and seeing how that structure works, right? Second, um, it does not take the text at face value, but displaces it into quite a different kind of object. So we'll try to understand what he means by that in a minute. Uh, and third, if the particular content of the text are replaceable, there is a sense in which one can say that content of the narrative is its structure itself. Okay, so if we are studying structure, what we are then studying is how does that structure work, right? And we're not really concerned about individual characters, individual signs, individual actions in there, because we are just trying to see, OK, if this is a romantic structure, what elements of that structure should be there, right? And uh, the actual content of the story doesn't really matter, because what we are trying to place is you know, who is the helper figure here? Who's the impediment? Uh, how does it work? So when we are studying the structure of it, you can replace the characters in a story with any other characters, as long as the structuralist aspects of how the story proceeds can be read carefully enough. So the room for brilliance or genius of an author is extremely becoming narrower because what we are studying is not the individual at utterance, but the structure of a narrative itself. And for that, then, we have to, why are we doing that? To that, to understand that, we have to understand the basics of Saussurean linguistics, right? On page 84, he gives us a brief discussion of uh, Ferdinand Saussure's study of linguistics. And that's crucial for structuralism and for our understanding of structuralism because most structuralism or structuralist criticism happens after what we call the linguistic turn. 
So he explains it. Let me explain it in my own words for so sure. There were certain things, and remember his book, Course in General uh, in General Linguistics, was not actually published by him. It was published by some of his students, right? And in that, while approaching study of languages, he, you know, lays down the groundwork. How is he going to do it? So his first hypothesis or first mode of practice is that he says, we will not study language diachronically, but synchronically. Languages have traditionally been studied diachronically, but they should be studied synchronically. What does he mean by it? Diachronically, meaning that studying the history of a language somewhere in the past and how does it come to the present. He said, we're not going to do that. We're going to study it synchronically, how a language functions at a given time. So we're going to study the language as a system, right? Then he also coins two terms, right? Parole and long. Long for him is the structure of language, and parole is the individual utterance. And if we buy into his first postulate that we will study language as a system, we already know that study of language then would be study of long itself and not of the individual utterances. And then he gives us a few basic principles of his linguistic study. So first of all, he defines the sign for us, right? A sign, anything, this thing, right, that I smoke occasionally. What he says is that a sign has two sides to it, right? Like a paper, one side and the other side. One part of it is called the signifier, and the other part of it is called the signified. The signifier is the acoustic sound that we make, the written script that we write, right? That is the signifier. The signified is the concept that comes into my mind. So when I say book, book, B-O-O-K, book, is the signifier. And the thing that comes into your mind is the signified. And the third part of the sign is the referent. And the referent is the actual thing in the world that a sign refers to tree, cat, Sudraja, right? But most of the times, referent kind of falls by the wayside. So signifier and signified. And then what he tells us is, and we're still on so sure, that the relationship between the signifier and the signified is completely arbitrary. There is no natural connection between the two. There is no ideal form from where I'm retrieving the word book to signify this, right? The connection is made arbitrary. There is no logic to it. There is no natural connection. It's completely arbitrary, but it gets fixed in a given structure of language, in a given culture where us language is. And after it is accepted socially, then it gets fixed, right? So signifier and signified, two sides of the sign. The relationship is arbitrary, but it gets fixed. And three. Signs mean something because of their difference from other signs. Now, this is really crucial to understand. That sign has no substantial meaning for itself. We know one sign because it's not another sign. So meaning is differential, right? And then if you place these signs, array them in a series, left to right or right to left, uh, they form a semiological chain, and that's how we construct sentences. So basically, assumptions from Sarshur, the sign has a two-part structure, signifier, signified, and sometimes a referent. Signs mean something because of their difference from other signs, and the relationship between the signifier and signified is completely arbitrary but gets fixed when it is accepted in a given linguistic culture. And that in order to understand all this, 
we need to understand language on a level of its system of its structure okay because if you and i are privy to a certain structure of language only then the parole will will make sense to us the individual utterance means something because it's plotted against a structure and that structure lends it meanings right so that's the beginning of the linguistic term that everything is in language language works through differences and you know individual utterance matters only because it can be understood against the larger system lung of a given language and that is the Sashorian language and its function right and kind of the solid ground for structuralism right? now um, immediately after Sashorian linguistic after the book is published there are challenges to it right on different aspects of it and we can go into that in a later lecture maybe I'll record it but right now like people who create space for move away from the primacy of the structure itself right uh, the first one on the list is Roman Jacobson right which he discusses on page 85 now what he's trying to tell us is that for Jacobson right uh, he defines like six elements of an act of communication so keeping in mind what we just learned about so sure what Jacobson is saying is that there are six elements of an act of communication okay there is always an addresser there is always an addressee there is always a message the message involves a shared code right and there is some form of contact that we need right I think I covered all the six right in order for an act of communication to happen right and the meaning of a fixed sign right can shift depending on where the emphasis is right and and the poetic right so if the emphasis is on the addressee then maybe it will become an order that i have to follow if the emphasis is on the addresser maybe the sign would then become an imperative but if the emphasis is on language itself right on the message itself then jacobson says the sign will be poetic and the poetic sign for jacobson is the most dense sign right it's a dense sign because it works on different levels right from literal signification to metaphoric and others and that is why literature and poetry right needs to be read on a higher level of abstraction right but what he's doing in the process what Jacobson gives us is that even though the signifier and signified come together the meaning is fixed that meaning can shift depending on what kind of a sign is it and also where the emphasis is in this six elements of communication right I hope that makes sense but there is a room being created for some kind of difference with the purely structuralist linguistics then Eagleton takes us to the uh, work of C.S. Pierce okay so now he is moving us into the discussion of what we will call uh, the field of semiotics right so people like uh, Pierce and uh, Barthes and others had decided or thought that based on this knowledge of language a new field of study science of study of can be developed which would be semiotics right and by semiotics he means any study of the science system itself and Pierce uh, distinguishes um, you know he gives us three basic kinds of science right on page 87 and what are those so there is the iconic sign indexical sign and symbolic sign so one sign can either be iconic 
or indexical or symbolic. So these are still variations on the sign system as defined by Sashur. So what is an iconic sign? An iconic sign is where the sign somehow resembles what it stands for, right? A photograph of a person, for example, right? Sign being indexical in which the sign is somehow associated it with what it is a sign of, right? So smoke, if you hear, see smoke, you will automatically assume fire. Right. Uh, if you see somewhere there is some seepage, some space is wet, you will associate it with water. So that is sign being indexical and sign being symbolic is where the sign is only uh, if we go to like Sashur, where as it's, the sign is only arbitrary or conventionally linked with its reference. Semiotics takes this up in, you know, many other forms, but symbolic is where sign can stand for something else, right? Um, Barth would, I mean, further theorize it into sign becoming mythic, right? Where, let's say, book, book can be a literal book, but a symbolic reading, it can be a book of religion, it can be a book of law, throwing a book at someone, that's the symbol not literally throwing a book at someone, but literally throwing the body of laws at someone, that's when the sign becomes symbolic. And then Pierce also defines like, you know, understanding of language through connotation, denotion through associations, and develops a whole system, which is termed semiotics, okay. Um, then, I mean, Eagleton on page 88, and this is like a summary that he's giving us of all these scholars who are scholars of semiotics, right, but also structuralists. Uh, he gives us, uh, you know, some work of uh, Yuri Lotman, and Lotman in one of his books then discusses, uh, you know, why is a poetic text, you know, richer? than normal text. But what he says is that a poetic text is, is sign is semantically saturated. And what he means by that is uh, condensing more information than any other discourse. So a poetic sign then is overly semantically saturated because it can have different, it can have an indexical meaning, it can have a symbolic meaning, it can stand for more than what it offers in terms of just the sign itself, rose, it can mean a, literally a flower, a sign symbol of love, depending on its color, it can be further semantically saturated. But all of this is developing into a science of study of sign systems themselves. How do they work? What levels can they be read in, right? Then people take Sashorian linguistics to, you know, different levels. So Claude Lévi-Strauss. Strauss, for example, um, as an anthropologist, just as Sashor had declared that the basic element of a sign system is a phony, right? one syllable or two. What Levi-Strauss suggests is that myths are formed by mythemes, right? And that most of the times we carry that knowledge within ourselves, right? And then when we read any myth, what we are actually reading is its parts. How does it come to be? It has to have a certain structural logic, right? If it's a goddess figure, you know, how do we understand one mythology, one figure of a godhead or a myth? We understand it because we plot it within a larger structure, a logical structure in which that one myth makes sense, right? Uh, and meaning, according to um, Levi Strauss, uh, were inherent in the human mind itself because we had the elements of understanding of mythene in our mind. Okay. And that is what 
we bring to bear when we read a myth, but then a larger structure of mythology and its log logic decides for us what we construe from a myth. So partially what's also happening in this process is that more and more the structure, the larger structure of which we can be a part is determining meaning for us, right? And we are no longer the centered subject who is construing meaning, right? In order to understand a sign, we have to need, know the structure within which the sign is posited, a myth within the logic of mythology within it, it is posited. And that is also what is Eagleton describes as the beginning of the decentering of the subject. Okay, so that's a very important term. What does it mean? This belief, right, the early uh, modernist or romantic belief that we, me, I myself am the one who makes meanings, right, who makes the world intelligible to me. And that presupposes a centered subject capable of critical thinking, capable of reason, capable of thought, capable of individual agency. But increasingly, that function is becoming decentered because so much of what I understand by a text or what I think about any science system is determined by things outside of myself. So that is the concept of the decentered subject. Then on page 91, he gives us uh, a brief discussion of uh, uh, A.J. Gremas's work. Right, uh, who also is defining in the science of uh, semiotics that in every narrative structure, right, there are these six actants, and I'll get to them. The actants are subject, object, sender, receiver, helper, opponent. So if you're going to read a story, right, each story, and he's building up on Vladimir Prop's work, right? Morphology of a tale. I've talked about it briefly, but Prop had gone and studied uh, Russian fairy tales and come up with structuring them into different structures. This is a Cinderella story, any story that involves that. And then he had also come up with, I think, 36 functions that you can trace all across stories. Now, what Gramas does is he gives us, okay, in every story, here are the six actants that you can find. And so the six accents of sub, and I already named them, and they can subsume props, various spheres of action and make for even more elegant simplicity. So what we are doing then is when we are reading a story, the purpose of explaining all this is, that instead of reading as a structuralist what an, a character does, what we will be reading is who is the subject in this story, right? What is the object of desire? Who sends someone on a quest? Who receives the results of that quest? Is there a figure who acts as a helper, the fairy godmother or whatever? And what is the opponent? So we are reading the stories according to the structural functions of these six actants in any given story. We're not necessarily worried about what's happening in the story itself, right? And then, more importantly, we can replace these characters with any characters in a story. So a structuralist reading doesn't really care about whether a story is original or not. It will be about the functions of these actants within the story. So, I mean, this is a huge discussion, but so far, you know, what we have learned then, let's summarize it, is that structuralism not starts with not of Fry, but he is the first one who moves into study of larger structures of literature and his mythos or myth uh, that he imagines are kind of pastoral, right? Um, they are based on seasons, naturally occurring and re reoccurring themes. 
that literature can be a part of. And we go to the Saussurean linguistics and we learn that this is how the sign system works. But the most important thing that comes out of that is the idea that it's not the individual sign that means anything or that is significant, but the system within which the sign is posited. Now that then leads us to reading narratives or stories, not in terms of what individual characters do, but how are they structured, right? And that is one kind of structuralism, right? And if we are studying structures, and if we go by Vladimir Prop, then we can reduce all major structures of stories to a few basic structures, right? And if we have done that, then as critics, if we are studying a story or a set of stories, we are not necessarily concerned with what happens in a story. We are looking at its sequencing, right? We are looking at its structuring, right? And if we go to, uh, you know, like uh, the discussion that Eagleton gives us of Ganet's work, right, on page 91, uh, we can then look at these technical aspects, right? Okay, so what he, how a story uh, operates, right? Uh, how does, uh, what what does analepsis mean, right? Um, obviously, he gives us the definition, five central categories of, of narrative analysis. The order is the first. It refers to the time order of the narrative, how it may operate by, Prelapsis, anticipation, or that's what creates suspense. Analepsis, which is a flashback, right? Or anachrony, you know, which uh, when it's not um, congruous with the timeline, right? Or, or discordances between story and plot, right? These are all, I mean, these look like very complex things, but I mean, if you read them, you carefully understand that these vocabularies are being developed just to give us more tools to study the structuring of the stories, right? And then what we will be looking for, let's say if we are looking at analepsis or flashbacks, right? Um, what we are then looking at is not necessarily what an actor does or what a player in a story does, what a character does, but what we will be studying structurally is how are flashbacks employed? What function do they serve within the story? where in the story are they, you know, plotted. Now, Genet further goes on to define, uh, you know, the mood of the story, right? And that he describes as uh, the perspective, you know, is it a narrative being told, being narrated by someone? So that would be what we will call uh, the, uh, diegesis. So we, when we mention the primary diegesis of a story, of a play, we will assume that that is story being narrated by someone else. When we are representing a story from within as the narrator, then it is a mimetic representation. So again, using these vocabularies, what we are then studying in any given story or in every given work of art is not what individual characters use, but how is the story structured? Right. So any study of what kind of narration is it? Right. First person narrator, second person narrator. And then what, what we associate with it has got nothing to do with individual narrators in a story. We construe those meanings from a story when you say, oh, this is an omniscient narrator, narrator. Right. And then you associate certain things with those. Those things are structural. Right. We take the structure in which how the flashbacks work. Right how the suspense is created through foreshadowing, right? It's those vocabularies that we analyze. Is the foreshadowing effective, right? Does that really create the suspense? Are the flashbacks effective in us? So think of it, we are looking at structuring of a story and not necessarily what the individual characters do. And that is what structuralism means, right? focus on the structure. Now, as a process, what ends up happening is the beginning of the decentering of the centered human subject. I already briefly talked about it, but 
somewhat the structure, just as in Sashur, it over-determined the sign, right? Similarly, in literary studies or in studies of human consciousness, we increasingly learn that maybe we are not the centered autonomous subjects with agency and that so much of who we are is over-determined by things outside of us. Language det over-determines who we are because we exist in it. So, so much of what develops from structuralism is not necessarily just how we study literature, but how we as humans are structured. And so the structural emphasis on the constructedness of human meaning represented a major advance, right? And this is on page 93, where he says, meanings was neither a private experience nor a divinely ordained occurrence. It was the product of certain shared systems of signification. So we enter this realm where we realized that we are who we are, not necessarily because God made us so or some other power made us so, and that what we are is partially because we are constructed by the environment, the structure of the culture in which we were raised, in which we grew up, the school we went to, right? There is more room then in structuralism to imagine a self structured by the environment. Maybe it can help us become more compassionate then, right? Because then we can posit that if someone is not doing well, maybe it's not their individual fault. Maybe something in their life has something to do with it. So it's, you see the kind of room that it creates. When we stop seeing individuals as permanently constructed individual signs and plot them against the larger structure within which they exist, maybe we can then develop somewhat a more compassionate worldview. I always use this example uh, of if you saw someone as you're walking on the street and if you saw someone, you know, being drunk and looking for food on the street or in a dumpster, if you looked at that person and thought, I will never do such a thing, right? If you thought that, then you believe in this idea of your own precise individual identity, which is immutable, unchangeable, and that no matter what the circumstances, you will always behave a certain way, right? That is the belief that goes behind that thought. But if you looked at that person and thought, hey, you know, given the same set of circumstances and experiences, I could be that person too. So maybe I should help that person. Now that is you looking at more than just the centered individual sealed human subject. You are looking at the structuralist reading of that sign, right? And you're saying, given the same structures in which this subjectivity was constructed, I could have become this person too. So that's also what structuralism somewhat does for us. But in literary studies, I'll conclude it here. I think it's getting really longer and I've not done a good job of explaining this chapter. I'll have to do a second part on part two of the chapter, which starts on page 93, where he talks about what are the gains of structuralism. I've briefly delved into it. But to sum up, Relying a little bit on Sashorian, not a lot on Sashorian linguistic, especially Sashor's emphasis on the structure of a language instead of the sign. Reading those within the context of the language system. Then knowing that a sign means something with difference from other signs, it works through a binary structure. All of these things then give structure a certain kind of primacy. And then people, instead of reading individual signs in anthropology and literary studies, start studying the structures within which a sign is posited. And that is what is the field of semiotics, right? Study of sign systems, how do they work? And then further development of how to do structuralist literary studies. So anytime you read a text, you read a story, 
you write about it, but you don't write about individual structures, but individual characters, but how a setting works, how does its structure work, what elements or actants are operative in it, you are doing a structuralist analysis of the text. I hope this was useful. Um, uh, and I hope you have quite a few questions. If you do, please feel free to send them my way and I will try my best to explain it better. And thank you so much for joining me. And I will see you soon, probably with a supplementary lecture still on structuralism, but maybe with the next chapter of Terry Eagleton. Thank you so much. Hello, welcome back. I'm Masood Raja, and in this lecture, I will build up on my previous lecture on Eagleton's chapter three. I'd mentioned there that I might do a supplementary uh, lecture to add a little bit more detail uh, towards the second part of the Eagleton chapter on structuralism and semiotics. And it starts on page 92 where he goes on to explain as to what were the gains of structuralism as literary movement and what were the responses to it and its major flaws. I briefly touched upon them in the previous lecture, but I thought I should build on that and see how Eagleton argues his point. So on page 92, he st starts with, uh, and I quote, loosely subjective talk was chastised. So this is what he's talking about, um, structuralism. And uh, literature was seen as a construct, right? And it, that it harbored a vital essence, a soul, which it was discourteous to temper with, was rudely unmasked as a bit of disguised theology. This whole idea that literature had a, an inherently untouchable essence right, which is deeply connected to humanism was kind of destroyed. And then what comes in structuralism is um, that there is nothing natural about it, right? And there is a strong critique of common sense, right? So structuralism by insisting that there are deep structures that determine the meanings of a text or a value of a text already, enabled us to dispel, dispel any pre-established commonsensical ideas about the integrity of literature and all. And Eagleton goes on to explain it further. Um, so one of the points that he gives is, is the, the structuralist emphasis on the constructedness of human meaning represented a major advance. Meaning was neither a private experience nor a divinely ordained occurrence. It was the product of certain shared systems of signification. Now this is on page 93. How do we reach this conclusion? So if you go back to what I discussed about Sosho, right? And his splitting of language into long and parole, right? And long is the system which he studies, right? So if we believe that it's the system that lends meaning to an individual utterance, right? Then if we extend it to literariness on literature, we already know that the value of literature is not in the words on the page or their originality, but the deeper structure against which we understand it. It's that structure that determines meaning for us. Right? So I don't bring my individual sensibilities or meaning to a text. I can only do that if I'm privy to the structure. And for that, I have to understand the structure. Otherwise, I will not be able to read the text. So my own ability to interact with the text is then in so many ways over-determined by the structure within which the text is posited. So, the second quote on page 94 is where Eagleton is saying, structuralism scandalized the literary establishment with its neglect of the individual, right? Its clinical approach to the mysteries of literature 
and its clear and incompatibility with common sense. So what are some common sense sensical ideas about literature, right? If you think in humanistic terms, is we thinking that we make all the meanings, that we can, things as they appear, can mean something to us, right? Or we can perceive them, right? But we already know that so many things that are commonsensical, the sun rises, right? The sun sets. We know scientifically that our perception is wrong. The sun doesn't rise, the earth revolves around it or revolves around its own axis, right? So structuralism then basically is telling us that literature is not what you, me, and others read into it, right? So any kind of humanism, the belief that what is most real is what is experienced and that the home of this rich, subtle, complex experience is literature itself, right? What structuralism does is, it says is your experiencing of literature is not what is meaningful. What is meaningful is understanding the deep structure of a text because only then you will know the meanings. It's just like as uh, Eagleton is quoting Freud there. Freud saying that even our most innermost experiences can be rendered differently depending on if we understand the structure of the psyche better. Why do I do a certain thing? Is it at the instant? So for example, if I get angry, that's an act of parole. Do you read it like that? Or if I constantly remain angry, is that part of my essence? Or is there something in my unconscious which is a deep structure that is forcing me or making me act a certain way? So we always then in structuralism are looking beyond the sign itself, right? So what he says is structuralism broke with conventional literary criticism in many ways. But it also remains preoccupied with language, right? as radical as it might. And at the same time, it has language itself remains the main obsession huh? of literary critics who are performing structuralism. What are they doing looking at the deep structures of language? And Eagleton, being a Marxist, is saying, you know, what about? labor, sexuality, political power, don't they have a bearing on the deep structure which we are trying to read in a literary text? So despite the revolutionary potential of structuralism, of unmooring the privileging of the words on a page and forcing us to go and look at the deeper structures within which those words mean something, by constantly remaining focused on language itself and on the text itself, structuralism fails to notice certain other things. Like, what is it outside of a text? What is it not necessarily outside of a language, but our place in the world, our class, our gender, our sexuality, right? The class structure within the text is produced or consumed. All of them have a bearing on reading a text but structuralism doesn't really go there, right? Then what he goes is, okay, if we go simply by structure, what about the concept of literature as a social pra practice, as a form of production, you know, as a form of production, which in, not in a reflectionist way, but which carries with it the social structure within which it was produced, right? Uh, but structuralists would not go there because that for them meant that they would then go to an originary moment. They could say, this is where the text originated. Now remember, if we are tracing the deep structure, all we have is signs upon signs within a given system. Right? And we have already sort of obliterated the idea of an autonomous human subject who can make statements because statements. So the debate is, you know, do we emerge in language and speak it, right? 
or do we exist because we have language which speaks through us? So if you have become as a human being, as a sign who can only be differentiated from others through difference, and, and if then you can mean only in difference to other signs, there is no possibility of an originary moment when a certain thing starts. And hence, instead of going out and locating the text within the social where it is produced, the structuralist constantly are looking at the text and its structures on. I think that's the point that Eagleton is trying to make over here. So that takes us to the what Eagleton describes as the anti-humanism of structuralism. So I'm going to read this from page 98 first. For the humanist tradition, meaning is something that I create or that we create together. But if we are structuralists, how could we create meaning unless the rule which govern it were already there? Right? That's a question from structuralists. However far back we push, however much we hunt for the origin of meaning, we will always find a structure already in place. This structure could, have been, could not simply have been the result of speech, for we were, were we able to speak coherently in the first place Without it, we could never discover the first sign from which it all began. Because, as Saussure makes clear, one sign presupposes another from which it differs. And that another, to be able to transmit a message at all, a person must already be caught up in and constituted by language, right? So this idea of a centered human being, which privileged my individual language, my individual speech, and hence centered me as a human subject comes to crisis. Because even if I speak, my utterance, where does it come from? What lends it meaning? Not me, of course, right? A shared code, right? And that shared code is the structure of language within which I speak. So then, in a way, there is no possibility of my own individual utterance because I utter it and it makes meaning, it becomes meaningful because of this inhuman system that exists outside of me. And that is what he means by the anti-humanism of the structuralist movement, right? There are quite a few responses, you know, um, to structuralism. Uh, the most important being Mikhail Bakhtin, right? Because uh, he was responding to it as this theory of language was being developed, right? And his idea is um, that language is inherently dialogic, right? It always presupposes an other, right? So therefore, when I make an utterance, that utterance might be posited within a given structure, but that utterance has to be dialogic. It can only mean something through the gaze of another, through the acceptance of another. And hence, beyond the structure, the utterance must have a recipient. And since it does need that, right, since an act of speech is dialogic, right, then there is something more than the structure at play in how we construe meaning, right? And this you will see also uh, in the first major critiques of structuralism that he cites, right? And, and that is um, the critique of structuralism uh, coming from another French theorist, right? Whose idea is that, um, that whatever we say, right, it is always posited in a discourse. And the discourse is nothing but an individual utterance within a system of language. And when we go to that, then we start reading the text as a discursive practice as produced in a given discourse which you, me, and others read still structurally, but we can bring our own modes of reading to it, our own 
discursively produced ways of understanding text. And so increasingly, these critics are trying to create space for the individual reader. But here's the problem. The structuralist at their best, when they address the reader, they imagine this super reader, okay? First of all, the reader who would know the conventions of a language, because only then you could re read the individual signs and really understand them. That makes structuralist readings of the text, and Eagleton does give us some example, that makes it extremely specialized. Right. He gives you an example of uh, a text read by Roman Jacobson and another who go and make these subtle structuralist readings of a text and make connections when Eagleton is saying most scholars would have missed that. So what the structuralists are then imagining is the super reader. Right. And what kind of a reader is it? I mean, this is a reader. An ideal reader, according to Eagleton, would need to be fully equipped with all the technical knowledge essential for deciphering the work. To be faultless in applying this knowledge and free of any hampering restrictions. That is the kind of reader the structuralists are imagining. And furthermore, if this model was pressed to extreme, he or she would have to be stateless, classless, ungendered, free of ethnic characteristics, and without limiting cultural assumptions, right? And hence, this reader, you know, completely independent, right? So let me explain. I, I hope I have not confused you enough. In From page 90, 92 to the end of the text, what Eagleton lays out for us is, here is what structuralism gained, right? What were its gains? It demystified that whole idea of romantic readings of a text, right? It also emphasized that in order to understand a text, we need to understand the deeper structure within which it is posited. Mm -hmm and not necessarily bring in our own ideas or our own prejudices to the text. It also enables us to decenter the human subject, right? By suggesting that so much of what we understand and know is determined by the larger structure within which we exist. But in the process of doing that, their extreme focus on language and linguistic structures then makes structuralist readings of the text extremely depoliticized, right? And the kind of reader that they imagine, the super reader has to be apolitical, doesn't care about his or her gender, his or her social role, or the social role of the act of production itself or material causes. All you do is read the deep structures within a text. Right, and not many people have the, you know, know how to do that. So literary crit criticism in this sense becomes even more technical. But more than that, while we are reading the structure of a fairy tale and everything else, all we are focusing on is the deeper structure, studying of the structure and how the story fits. There is no effort here, even though the possibility was there to read larger social structures and their implications. Structuralism never goes there, right? And it becomes even more apolitical and esoteric. Now, he also mentions in these pages the work by John Searle and J.L. Austin, who are considered the major theorists of the speech act theory, right? And the idea that most of the time language is also performative. Right, And depending on who is speaking and saying what, we use language to express what we intend to do. I will eat this dinner, right? And that that in itself is a response to over-determining aspects of the lung itself, of the structure itself. So by the end of this chapter, Eagleton has given us then what are the gains of structuralism, how specialized it becomes, and the responses that are developing against it more prominently 
people who have started emphasizing the role of sociality of literature itself, the role of social structures, right? And the role of the location of the text within a given politics. But also constantly the reader is entering the text, but the reader is not entering the text as this idealized individual reader, but reader as produced by the socio-political. But peace and love, and thank you so much. Structures by class, by gender and sexuality as he or she exists. So that's kind of the entry into post-structuralism. So I hope this uh, chapter, part of the chapter, explains a bit from page 92 to the end of the chapter. Uh, I'm pretty sure I haven't done a good job of it. But if you have any questions, anything that you would like to me to respond to, feel free to post a comment or send your questions my way, and I'll be very happy to answer those. Until then, thank you so much and stay safe.